Hi, this is Dr. Steven Seiler. You guys know that I enjoy endurance sports. I am a consumer of them as well, so I like to watch. And, and one of the recent big endurance events that I enjoyed watching was the uh, World Championship Road Race in professional cycling. I watched both the women's road race and the men's road race. Both were great events um, and wonderful competitions. I'm going to focus on the men's road race here because I actually have uh, the pleasure of working a bit with some riders that, that were in that race. And I'm working with a team here in Norway uh, that is their home team. Uh, and then they represented Norway as part of the national team. Uh, the team I am working with is Uno X Pro Cycling Team, which is a professional team one one step below the world tour level, and they are a, defi- a, a developmental team. So their uh, stated role or their goal is to help Norwegian and Danish riders to develop and to take the next step in in their cycling career which for most of them will mean to try to land a contract on the the main world tour teams Uh, but i've been lucky enough to then receive data from the race the world championship road race uh, of one of the riders marcus holgor this data was is being shown to you with permission from both the UNOX team and from Marcus himself. So I really appreciate that. And then the analysis I'm going to show you is kind of powered by uh, the Endura program that I've developed with John Peters. Uh, and I use that term I've developed carefully because he's the one that's done the hard work on the, the data coding. And I'm just the one that says what I want it to do and tells him when it actually works. But here's the road race that we recently saw. It was held in uh, Italy. It was, as they often are, a circuit where the, the athletes complete the circuit multiple times. So it is this kind of war of attrition. Uh, in this case, nine laps, 258 kilometers, long day on the bike, six hours and 40 minutes or so for the winter. Um, And obviously, many that do not end up finishing the race uh, for various reasons. This race is also marked by having some significant climbs that the athletes have to repeat over and over. Uh, Two-kilometer climb, um, Mazzolano and the Sima Galisterna climb. So this led to at least some of the, the typical sprinter types in pro cycling, basically, either not being a content, not even showing up or really not being uh, part of the part of the final decision as to who would become world champion. Now here is the particular athlete Marcus Holgo. He's on this Uno X team. Uh, here's his basic data which I use to analyze and to calibrate the the power and heart rate and so forth that are presented in these typical ride files. I also have his power duration data from WKO provided by his coach. This is uh, over uh, a recent time frame, I believe last 90 days. It's not perfect, we know, because athletes are not always giving maximum efforts, you know, like as in a test, but this is data from training, data from races that are part of the WKO database Uh, and then occasionally you'll see for example here is a 12 minute segment that has the same power as his best 15 minute segment well then obviously that's really not a a true best effort but this gives us some useful information I also have uh, taken this data this window and used it to calculate critical power and the W prime for those who are familiar with that methodology Uh, This gives you the calculated values you see, 414 watt critical power, 22 watt uh, W prime, 22 kilojoule W prime, uh, FTP based on his 414 uh, watt 20 minute result, whether you use 0.95, 0.9 and so forth. And then his 364 watt for 60 minutes. So this gives you some calibration. He also was in the lab many several months ago, but in 2020 as part of a study here in Norway. 
uh, for another group, and these are his data, about 76 mLs per kg, 382 watt based on a lactate, four millimolar, you know, absolute value, 513 watts at the end of a VO2 max test. So all of these match up pretty well. Uh, whichever source you're using gives you a reasonable idea. Now, is this exceptional? Well, yeah, compared to the population, is it exceptional in the pro peloton? No, not necessarily. Uh, you know, he, he's a strong rider, but he's in this elite group and within other an elite group. Uh, this is kind of what you see. And so um, it's worth, you know, noting that. Uh, he's probably best uh, out here. He has good repeatability. He's, if you look at his data from Pro Cycling Stats, his best results come from from uh, GC, where he's doing a, a, a stage races and so forth. So he's he's a stayer, and he does well in these longer competitions. I, th I think would be fair to say he's not a sprinter, although his his brother is more of a sprinter, and he's also on this team. In fact, that's his brother there, and there's the coach, Espen Ereschild. But again, developmental team, great to work with, helping the athletes take the next step and learning all the aspects of becoming professional athletes. Uh, here is the 60-second to 60-minute power duration curve for the team. So I've just taken the average, and I've just looked at one you know the main part of it from one minute to 60 minutes and that gives you a reference and again you could say that uh, that the athlete i'm showing you who was did the best of any of the norwegians in the in the world championship road race is a bit above on all of these values above the average and maybe not so above or even below on sprint you know the the top sprinters have much higher values so it kind of positions him uh, where he is and, and what his strengths are among these athletes. Now here is the race or the race course. It was in Italy. It was a nine lap circuit, as I said, and maybe what dis what makes it specific or interesting and what defines the strategy for the riders are these climbs that each lap had two significant climbs, actually three climbs, but uh, the two that get the most attention are Mazzolano and Galisterna, two about two kilometers, seven percent uh, on average grade. Looks steeper here, but this is just the the, the profile from uh, GPS data. Now I've used again the Endura platform, uh, and it's in beta form. It's free, and you can go in using the address below that you see if you want to try this out. Uh, and uh, just so just so you know where the where the pictures are coming from now here's the first picture I'll show you this I've taken the raw data file I've selected heart rate and used percentage of maximum heart rate calibrated against uh, the values given to me by the athlete uh, I've overlaid the the elevation you see on the the right side y-axis and then you can get an idea of the overall uh, intensity and how it's changing and of course what you see is it's the climbs where heart rate is at its highest where intensity is highest where power output is highest uh, but here i've just taken the nine laps taken the average here with the duration you see things are getting faster as you go until the end when this athlete was finally uh, lost the lead group uh, so here he's at his limit at about 95 percent maximum heart rate you know in these big pushes uh, here he has actually brought it down because now you could say it's either fatigue going empty, glycogen depletion, many different reasons, but uh, the athlete is, is, you might say, fatiguing or failing, not at 100% of max heart rate, uh, but actually at about 95, which is very typical. You know, you're not going to see 100% of heart rate max after six and a half hours uh, on the bike usually. Uh, they almost cannot mobilize that much because there is so much glycogen depletion. They, the heart is essentially a slave to their ability to mobilize muscle. And when the muscle is fatigued, uh, then that limits how high the heart rate will actually go. Uh, just so that's a, so you shouldn't confuse 95% max heart rate with 95% effort. 
Uh, it's full effort, full mobilization, but the tank is empty. And so this was the critical point in the race. Now, again, if we go back and look at the, the race and think of it as these three phases, and in each phase they are doing three climbs on each lap and each so if we combine those there's three climb you know the first climb three of the second and three of the third in each of these phases and that's what i've done in the next analysis is i've actually gone in I analyzed by elevation and, and and found these different segments in the race and then aggregated them so you can get an idea of how the athletes are dissipating or dis using their energy and, I, and this is just one athlete. It's not the entire peloton or the actual lead group. But because this athlete is in that lead group and protected or within that pellet, that group, it was about, by towards the end, it was, you know, f under 40 riders. Uh, you get an idea of what the representative pace and development of the race looked like. And so you can see that the climbs, you know, initially start reasonably well. These are powers that many of you could handle and after an hour of riding and even I could maybe that one at least uh, but as things progress powers get higher and of course fatigue is is impacting you know they they really no longer have that same threshold power they had after 20 minutes after five hours so it's worthwhile to remember that we're we're referencing this to a capacity that's that is declining with fatigue uh, but but that doesn't show up here because we use it as a percentage of uh, often their their maximum power so things are getting faster along the way and then you reach these critical points when the athlete is able either can able to stay with the lead group or is not uh, and you also if you follow the critical power concept this is the work above red line uh, I've defined the red line as the critical power here so this is the actual W prime kilojoules of energy that are utilized above critical power in these different segments and then I've aggregated that and you see this is another way of showing how the intensity is heating up as the athlete is fatiguing becoming more glycogen depleted as it's getting more difficult to mobilize in these high intensities in this work above critical power. Uh, so, so this is what makes these races uh, wars of attrition, uh, as we said at the outset. If you look at the distribution of, of work as a percentage of maximum heart rate, this is duration in minutes, how many minutes they spent at the different relative percentages of their max heart rate or he spent i should say uh but it's probably pretty representative you know a lot of work here uh and then some work in this higher intensity really never got above 95 percent of max during a six and a half hour race again that's kind of this protect you know not burning matches the cost of of an athlete climbing at max is extremely high and would be a very likely scenario for getting dropped <laughs> on the subsequent descent or the next hill. If you look at the duration distribution based on watts, what I went in is individualize this using some of these athletes' cutoffs. This is 703 is his 60 second power. 492 is his six minute power. 414 is his best 20 minute power and 364 is his best 60 minute power so those give you some reference points and you can see well how many minutes how much time did the athletes spend in these different work level ranges and you see when you put it all together it's a lot of time at a very high intensity but that wouldn't be possible if it wasn't also true that there's a lot of time spent at very low intensity during these races and this is it's that's part of the athlete's job as well is to protect themselves to try to avoid uh, expending energy when they can uh, through you know getting staying behind the wheels you know, not using energy during descents and so forth so those two kind of are the yin and yang of a long race is it's not an even intensity it's not an even power distribution 
but you're protecting your matches and then, and then we see who has the most who can repeat this at the end of the race. And if you look at it in, the, in that way, if you think of these so-called matches the cyclists talk about, this, this ability to preserve that, uh, that those big mobilization efforts until the end, Here's, here I've used 20-minute power or cr critical power as the cutoff. They were both 414 watts in this athlete, in Marcus's profile. They, they, those two give you the same number. And you see in the early stages, this is duration in seconds, so that's uh, one hour, two hours, three hours, and so forth. You see in the first half of the race, very little high-intensity mobilization, keeping, keeping this powder dry as we say trying not to expend too much energy on the climbs but then in the second half of the race and particularly the third th third of the race the third three lap segment this is when you see the big pushes either is, is expressed as duration these are individual points where this athlete spends like 60 seconds or so at high intensity or you can look at it as expressed as kilojoules kilojoule segments it gives you basically the same picture and it just shows you how the drama unfolds and when the crescendo happens. This is actually an athlete that, that peaks here, gets dropped, doesn't, you know, this is best effort. And, and then the last lap, he's actually more on his own or in a, a, a smaller group and now not pushing as hard, more of a trying to just maintain a steady state. Uh, here I've just used the same thing, but this time I've raised the threshold up to 492 watts to say, well, if you want to just look at the segments that you might almost define as anaerobic because they're above his VO2 max power, uh, the same basic picture unfolds. But what you see is most of the segments, most of the energy efforts are short. You know, the athlete is not going to be able to spend big chunks of time at such high power outputs uh, without paying a big price. And particularly if they're coming one after the other with very little recovery time in between. So it's that combination of the duration of these high intensity segments and that they're coming uh, faster. There's less recovery time in between. This high intensity repeatability that eventually uh leads to thinning out the the peloton and a smaller group that ultimately decides the victory uh, in this case this athlete made it almost to the very end but uh, lost contact with the very best riders uh, in the ninth lap so that's what they look like that's what these wars of attrition look like i want to thank uh, Marcus Holgor for uh, giving me permission to use this data and also thank his team and his coach, you know X and Espen Ashold for permission to and for the cooperation with the team and the permission to use the, the data uh, for educational purposes. So that's it from me for now. Thanks a lot.